Good evening. Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Scott Schaefer. Tonight, we'll show you what it really cost California to pay off a decade old debt. And I'm Tui Vu. First, though, this week, a convicted felon accused San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee of accepting bribes. Such an accusation coming from a man who is behind bars awaiting trial and money laundering charges might be easy to dismiss. But the felon in question is Raymond Shrimp Boy Chow. Chow previously served time for armed robbery. He was indicted last year as part of a federal criminal investigation that ended the career of a prominent San Francisco politician, former state Senator Leland Yi. In a bid to have the charges against Chow dropped, his attorneys filed a court motion claiming he was unfairly targeted by the government's politically tainted selective prosecution. Chow's lawyers write that the FBI alleged that Ed Lee took substantial bribes in exchange for favors and that federal prosecutors gave Lee and other public officials a pass, ignoring overwhelming evidence against them. Mayor Lee has denied the allegations. So have Board of Supervisors President London Breed and Alameda County Assistant District Attorney Sharman Bach, who were also mentioned in the filing. Bach has been placed on paid leave. And the Chronicle reports that both the city attorney and the district attorney are investigating claims pertaining to the case. Joining us now are Marisa Lagos, KQED's politics and government reporter, and Rory Little, former federal prosecutor and a professor at Hastings College of Law. Welcome to you both. Uh, Rory, let me begin with you. Federal prosecutor, you know how these public corruption cases work. If you were Mayor Ed Lee, how worried would you be? So you have to remember these allegations come from his longtime rival convicted felon Raymond Chow, not from the prosecution, not from the government. If I'm Ed Lee, I, I've got lawyers and I, I keep an eye on what's going on, but I don't think this filing has given any direct evidence that uh, Mayor Lee uh, did anything at this point. Why do you call Raymond Chow an, an old adversary of the mayor? Oh, they've been poli they're political rivals. Uh, Chow said, oh, I'm going to go legitimate and I'm going to sort of run Chinatown. And, the, you know, there's an Asian-American set of rivalries there. Uh, Chow sued him a year ago uh, on these same sort of allegations that, that he was taking bribes or whatever. Uh, that lawsuit, as far as I know, hasn't gone anywhere. They've been uh, fighting for a long time. And a lot of the what, what was in this filing was really um, Shrimp Boy's attorney is saying, you know, this was a selective prosecution, and that you know the people, the, the people that sort of push this and that that we think are responsible are doing it because they didn't like the sort of stature that Chow got after he got out of prison in 2002. So there's sort of this political allegation underneath all of it to begin with. And Rory, with this idea of a selective prosecution, that there was even bias involved because he's uh, Asian American, some of the other people involved were African American. I mean, what? How does that play out? Is there, is there how much legitimacy is there to this? So, so the legal theory of selective prosecution is it, it is not that you can't select. Prosecutors select all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have to. And it's not a defense. We've all been sort of stopped for speeding and we say to the officer, I, everybody else was going 70. And the <laughs> officer just says, well, I got you. Uh, there's no defense because you were selected. It has to be for an improper reason. Um, it's not based on uh, ethnicity here. It doesn't appear to be. You know, we indicted an Asian and uh, didn't indict an Asian. There's no selection there. Um, so it's a hard theory to win. It's a hard theory to get discovery on. The Supreme Court has sort of turned it away a number of times. Um, he's saying that it's because of his speech, but remember, he's also just distracting from his own case. There's nothing in these pleadings that says Raymond Chow is innocent. It simply says maybe some other people should be indicted. <laughs> Along with and maybe the prosecutor <laughs> will indict him. I mean, there right. may be further indictments. Well, well, so what do you think is really driving this? Um, is it because Shrimp Boy, uh, Raymond Chow, is just really mad that uh, he's, he feels like he's being singled out while all these other officials are, uh, in his mind, going scot-free? Is it Tony Serra, his attorney, just enjoying kicking up a dust storm, as we know he likes to do, and he likes to really give it to the, the government? Yeah, this is a win-win for Tony Serra, in a sense, because he, he, his client must be very angry that he is sitting in jail while people he believes did just what he did are not. So he's angry, saying, go after those guys. And Tony Serra loves to embarrass the government. And the character of this filing is the government should be embarrassed because they missed the boat on a few people. So, Marisa, politics. Uh, what are people saying about this at City Hall? Not just the mayor is involved, but there are a lot of longtime uh, city workers, people like Zula Jones, who used to work with the Human Rights Commission, uh, Anne Marie Conroy, who uh, was an appointee of Willie Brown, now works in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Her name came, came up. So, what are people at City Hall saying? You know, I think for at least critics, this sort 
sort of, if not confirmed, sort of adds fuel to the fire of long-standing suspicions that maybe he hasn't been totally clean. But as we've mentioned before, there's nothing in here that directly implicates the mayor. Now, people like Zula Jones, a former Human Rights Commission official, um, somebody else who was on the Human Rights Commission, Reverend Amos Brown in uh, China or in um, the the Black community, who's a huge leader, they actually are on wiretaps that were quoted by the defense. And so I think for them, there might there's there's a little bit more concern among City Hall that maybe there is something more out there. Maybe the prosecutors are still investigating it. And um, Zula Jones was the focus of previous FBI investigations. Right. right? She was indicted back uh, about 15 years ago for sort of steering city contracts in an unethical manner. The charges were ultimately dropped. But I think it does raise questions. Why was she involved in fundraising efforts, you know, 15 years later for, uh, or 10 years later for Mayor Ed Lee when he was running for re-election? And, and let's remind folks, though, in case people haven't closely followed the story, Zula Jones is accused in this case of, of trying to solicit um, improper campaign contributions on Ed Lee's behalf to retire his campaign uh, debts. And so in one case, $10,000 broken up into smaller $500 checks to so to make it seem like it was following well, she, campaign yeah. contribution I laws. I mean, she's on, if you believe the filings and that these are directly from the Fed's discovery, she's on tape talking to undercover agents saying she did this. But you know, you've got to if you believe the filings, these are not filings by the government. No. These, the government hasn't even responded yet. They've got a couple weeks to respond. Well, they have said that they didn't think that all of this information should have been disclosed. Well, there's, they're there's not saying a, it's not a accurate, order. though, right? Well, they haven't said anything yet. They haven't said one way or the other, and they're not going to. They're going to file their response when it's time to file. And you may hear them say, this is wrong. They may, you may hear them say, hey, there's other things. You know, you've only taken an excerpt out of a transcript. There's more to the story. Well, let me ask you about the scope of the investigation, Lori. I mean, how how common is it for uh, prosecutors to carve out a chunk of a case at a time? Let's say they have enough to indict these people. They'll do so at this time, but they're still investigating all these other people, and they may roll out other chunks down the line. Absolutely right. I mean, you, you go out with an undercover operation and a big wiretap, you're going to get all kinds of tangents. You're going to get all kinds of different ideas. And you're going to focus on the people that you were focused on to begin with, but you're not going to let everything else go and drop it. So they've indicted what they felt they could indict immediately. And, and Leland Yee was not even the focus of the original well, investigation. Well, Leland Yee was, right? a, was a tangent all by himself. The corruption thing became a tangent from the shrimp boy chow thing. Right. I mean, I think that's important that this was not a political corruption investigation. This was a arms dealings, m money laundering, you know, trafficking, guns and other things investigation that sort of spun off into the Leland Yee stuff. I mean, what's interesting about uh, what Chow's attorneys are alleging is that essentially they got information about other public corruption and sort of didn't go down that path, if anything else. And what they're saying is that it was for political reasons, that the people involved, you know, have very high connections. Um, let me let me just say that that just is not going to hold water. The federal prosecutor and the FBI agent whose promotions depend on successful prosecution in a pro public corruption context aren't going to back off of somebody because like the they're the mayor. Right. I mean, these, the federal, that's the value of having federal prosecutors, frankly, is they don't care about the local politics and they want the most uh, bang for their buck. So does that mean that this filing this week by Tony Serra and his law firm is basically a Hail Mary pass? You know, Hail Mary, I, I, Tony Serra is a great lawyer. He's a legend in the Bay Area and he is distracting. He is reviving interest in his client's case. He's speaking to jurors, potential jurors, frankly. Through the uh, media. Through the media. And he has got the judge more interested than maybe the judge was, in it, you know, two weeks ago. So he, this, is, this accomplishes something for him. Is he going to win on this motion? Not based on what I've seen. But it's when you scramble the deck, you know, some, something may happen, right? Something Another may card happen. may drop. And if the government comes in and says something too aggressive or too overconfident, so that Judge Breyer, who's an experienced judge, is not happy with the government, you could see further development. T tell us about Judge Charles Breyer. I mean, you taught a class with him. You know him quite well. He's overseeing this case. What is he like, and, and how do you think he might be reacting to this latest, all these latest allegations coming out this week? You know, Chuck Breyer, and I did teach with him for a long time, uh, is a very smart and experienced judge, and he's nationally prominent. His brother is Stephen Breyer, who's on the U.S. Supreme Court. 
Uh, I always introduce Chuck Breyer as the smarter and better looking brother, <laughs> but uh, he, he, he knows where the ground is. And my guess is he's reading uh, the press, but he's not absorbing it. He's going to wait to see what the government's filing says. He's going to decide it based on the law. He doesn't really have a side. He's been a prosecutor and a defense attorney, and he's been a judge for a long time. So I don't think you're going to see anything immediately coming from the judge until there's a hearing on the case. Maurice, coming back to the politics of this, a lot of the people named here, I mean, starting with Ed Lee, Zula Jones, Anne-Marie Conroy, Amos Brown, Keith uh, Jackson, who was indicted earlier, they do have, and others, do have ties to Willie Brown. Uh, and I'm just wondering, what does that tell you? Is this just what we expected, that, uh, you know, Willie's a very influential guy, even though he hasn't been in office for a long time? Or is there, is there, is there a way of doing business around him and the people that he's worked with and mentored, maybe, uh, that suggests something else? I mean, I think there's suspicions of that, and they've never been proven. Willie Brown was a target of FBI investigations in the past. Um, it is interesting, somebody, an insider this week, sort of noted to me that there was never this kind of suspicion around Mayor Gavin Newsom for all of his enemies in town and Other all of his faults. Perhaps. Yeah, but I do think that, you know, there have been questions around Ed Lee and his association with Willie Brown and with uh, Chinatown powerhouse Rose Pack ever since he was appointed interim mayor and decided to run after promising he wouldn't. There were multiple investigations and accusations leveled against the independent expenditure account that pushed him to run that was very heavily um, involved, you know, with, with Brown and Pack. And there was actually allegations that that same group was essentially engaging in voter fraud around the election by filling out ballots for people in China. And he's now running unopposed. I mean, he's there's an unopposed. election in November, there's no one running No, and I think him. so that's the fascinating thing. I don't see, you know, unless we see some explosive indictments, that this is really going to affect his political career in the short term. Um, you know, State Senator Mark Leno had, had way to run against him. I'm I haven't talked to Leno, but I'm sure he's kicking himself a little what, bit right what, now. What, what are people saying around City Hall in light of all these allegations? You know, I mean, there's a ton of interest. I think that there is a lot of... Um, because some of the other people named in this, we mentioned London Breed, Supervisor Malia Cohen. I mean, there's, again, there's nothing in here that directly implicates them. There's other people talking about them. And as you mentioned, you know, people like Keith Jackson, who has already pleaded guilty to some pretty severe charges around racketeering, um, like Senator Yee, you know, these aren't people that are necessarily the most trustworthy, but they were still part of this political world. And I think that's where the questions are. Why, why are these people involved in this when you know that they have this history. And coming back to the investigation, one of the names that also popped up was David Chu, the former San Francisco <laughs> supervisor, now in the assembly, had also run for mayor. Uh, he wore a wire uh, to a meeting. Well, apparently with he wore a wire to protect himself. Though. Yeah. He was feeling he threatened. He believed that he had been yeah. threatened and was threatened by Chow. And the FBI views this as an evidence gathering technique. Sure. So I don't think he wore it because he was sort of cooperating on an immunity deal or something. Yeah. I think he wore it for his own protection. But that no, sends chills through the through yeah, the halls of I mean, City I, Hall, I actually I would imagine. think it's a bit of a shame that his name was wrapped up in this because compared to everything else in here, even though, you know, knowing they are allegations, his case was a very different one. He had been contacted independently by the local police um, after Chow made some very public threats uh, on David Chu, and then the FBI approached him. It sounds like he wore a wire one night at one Chinatown event, and that was sort of the end of it. But yeah, I, I don't think any politician wants to be known as the person wearing yeah, a Willie's wire. Willie's not going to be having you know lunch with him anytime <laughs> no. soon. If everybody run in politics thinks everybody else is wearing a wire, maybe we'll get more honest politics. <laughs> it's like cameras the police The prosecutor's off. view is this is not such a bad thing. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. You know, I have a question about how... Um, how these cases are pursued. When you have a case with so many multiple targets all of a sudden, uh, how do they decide who to go after? Is it the quickest and easiest target, or do they kind of hold off and wait for the bigger fish down the line? What can we expect to see? Well, you, for first, you can expect that a large number of prosecutors are focused on this, and they divide it up. They'll say, okay, you're the shrimp boy chow prosecutors, you're the Leland Yee prosecutors, you're the investigators of the other aspects of the wire that we haven't charged yet. You'll see that kind of division. Um, I think prosecutors basically wait until they have a good case and then they charge it. And, and they don't wait for everybody. So mm -hmm. you can seal off chunks of it as they've done here. And but on, there may be more cases yeah, to come. Sir. And on that note, I know that 
Rory, and I believe him, that, you know, that there wouldn't be a sort of political reason for a prosecutor or an FBI agent not to pursue somebody for political reasons. But I think that in the court of public opinion, this filing raises some interesting questions. The only politician charged was Leland Yee, who didn't have a lot of friends and connections. Everybody else in here who does have ties, you know, up to the Obama administration, to Senator Dianne Feinstein, who's sort of part of the political muscle in this town, hasn't yeah. been touched. We're so a little short I think on, that does raise questions. It does. It, you know, I, this sort of reminds me a little bit, or it brings up the U.S. Attorney's investigation of Barry Bonds, uh, which was very controversial. A lot of people wondered if it was a waste of time, a big fishing expedition. Now the charges have been dropped by the federal government. So it does, it, it, they're not totally clean in all this either. Right, but let's remember there was not an investigation of Barry Bonds. There was an investigation of steroid use in Major League Baseball. Barry Bonds was called in as a witness and given immunity. It wasn't until he lied to the grand jury, and he hasn't been convicted of that lie, but many people think he did lie, that the U.S. Attorney's Office went after him. So, I mean, the government follows the evidence, and uh, they don't, uh, I, I hope, they don't play politics. But, uh, on the issue of immunity, it's too late for Leland Yee. He pleaded guilty already to racketeering charges, but he hasn't been sentenced. Do you right. think that there's a chance that the feds are perhaps still getting information out of him and going for some kind of bargain here? You just you just can't know, but it's not out of the question. Uh, and, and when someone is facing a serious federal sentencing, they have every incentive to cooperate, even though his plea agreement has no cooperation mentioned in it. That, that when you're dealing with Shrimp Boy Chow, that may be a very valuable thing to not put that in your agreement. Yeah. So and how what about happens next? Well, well we keep Lisa. watching this. I mean, yeah. it seems like every time there's a new filing, we have uh, something else to chew over. And, and it doesn't seem, I mean, Shrimp Boy Chow and his attorneys have made clear they want to go to trial. So this okay. could get really fun. All right. Rory Salagos, Rory Little, thanks so much for coming thanks. in. Always entertaining. <laughs> Our pleasure. Thank you. Arnold Schwarzenegger rode into the governor's office on a promise of putting California's fiscal house in order. But when the smoke cleared, it was evident he left behind a serious debt hangover. We all know what a relief it is to pay off a big debt, right? Say a student loan or a credit card bill. Well, this week, California taxpayers are finally off the hook for a debt that has loomed for more than a decade. The state took on this $14 billion debt under the Schwarzenegger administration. Our political editor, John Myers, is here to tell us what it cost to pay off that huge debt, John. A lot. That's the headline, I think. If you talk about these debts that people pay off and you try to envision a million dollars, a million dollars a day, every day, for 11 years. That is the average of what it took in interest payments to pay this off. It was an enormous amount of money, but the reality is there was nothing about the plan that was normal. The stakes were huge, the capital was polarized, and no borrowing plan had ever been sold to Californians like this one. Do I have your help? Yeah. I don't hear you. Do I have your help? Shortly after taking office, Arnold Schwarzenegger needed help from California voters. The state was running out of money to pay its bills. Schwarzenegger had defeated Gray Davis in the 2003 recall campaign by promising to fix the state's budget deficit. His solution, a bailout, and required voter approval. To convince skeptical Californians, Schwarzenegger repeatedly made this claim. It's very important for people to understand we are not borrowing new money. We are refinancing an inherited debt. But it was borrowing new money, a lot of it. Proposition 57 required voter approval to sell up to $15 billion in state bonds to investors and repay them with sales taxes. The Republican governor was able to sell the idea as bipartisan when the state's controller, we Democrat Steve Wesley, agreed to campaign the for the measure. We were elected to fix problems. You can't fiddle around with politics when you're on the edge of potentially not making payroll for 300,000 people. Wesley and Schwarzenegger yes. appeared at town halls and on televisions, yeah, they, they selling Prop 57 and its oh, companion, man. the balanced budget oh, measure, Prop 58. The, the legislature placed two measures on a ballot that comprise a bipartisan balanced budget plan. Proposition 57 will refinance past deficit borrowing. With but Prop 57 also set in place a long and expensive payback plan, largely hidden from the public, Wesley now concedes that plan put a big burden on the state. And I think some of those criticisms are founded. The catch is we had such an immediate financial crisis because there had been so many commitments made in the past 
the governor and I did the only thing we could do. There were others in the Capitol and around California who wanted more than just a quick fix. One was John Capol of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. The anti-tax group preferred more limits on state spending, but reluctantly backed Schwarzenegger's plan because it required voter approval. But what he did do is he transformed it into something that would pass legal muster, but also kind of invest the California voter into we're part of the solution as well. Other critics thought voters should have been asked to solve the state's long-term budget problems. You know, there was a lot of, um, at the time, talk about, oh, there's broad bipartisan support. But in fact, it was bipartisan support to kick the can down the road. Democrat Phil Angelides, who was then state treasurer, had proposed a tax increase on the wealthiest Californians. No one wanted to say the T word. No one wanted to say taxes. No one wanted to be subject to that attack. The result of that was, is when the Great Recession came on, California was in woeful shape. For years, but in 2004, the focus was on the problem at hand. And voters overwhelmingly passed both Propositions 57 and 58. Which leads us to this week in Sacramento, when the state officially paid off its budget deficit from 2003. The final tab included a big interest payment. Here's what those deficit bonds really cost taxpayers. California borrowed a total of about $14 billion. The state paid $4.8 billion in interest, an effective interest rate over time of almost 34%. So what could $4.8 billion buy? Well, it's enough to pay the state's share of the University of California's budget for more than a year, or it's two and a half years of funding for CAL FIRE, the state agency that fights wildfires, or it's the equivalent of an extra $658 of spending for every student in California's K-12 schools. The state could have spent even more money on interest payments, but Governor Jerry Brown used a tax revenue windfall to help pay off the debt sooner. Say very simply that the state is definitely on the rebound from just a few years ago. Brown also convinced voters last November to change the budget process to avoid a similar crisis in the future. Lawmakers now have to set aside more tax dollars in a rainy day fund. But if you can't think ahead a few years and realize you don't have the money, if you do that in your own personal life, you know, you go bankrupt. So we can't do that here either. So, John Myers, you'd have to say this is not Arnold Schwarzenegger's finest hour. <laughs> what is the former governor saying about this, if anything? Well, he hasn't said much. Um, I did uh, ask for some comment. Uh, I got an email back that basically said he's happy that the Prop 57 chapter is over, this fiscal issue, and he's also happy that the voters passed Prop 58. It's important to note that Prop 58 really didn't have a lot of teeth in it, but the one thing it did do is it said you could never borrow for a deficit again. So this really was a one-time deal. And it was a heck of an expensive one-time deal, as we've been talking about. Well, take us back to that time, because uh, it was a recession. But were there other things during that time, whether it's the structure of uh, the political government or the budget process, that really made it necessary for California to borrow so much money back then? Yeah, it, it was a mess. I mean, we, you know, in covering this, you felt that there were no good options. And so the first one was there was a structural problem with the budget. It took a supermajority of each house of the legislature to pass a budget, which was almost impossible, because the Republicans sure. wouldn't tax the Democrats wouldn't cut enough. And then uh, we were running out of money. And then there was this need to try to find some kind of quick fix. I mean, it's really important, I think, also to point out that the deficit bond idea actually predated Arnold Schwarzenegger. There were people in Sacramento who had been talking about it. Schwarzenegger took it to the voters, made this great big sales pitch, probably too big. And uh, that was the rest of the So story. has anything changed over the past decade then? Well, the big thing that's changed is it's easier to pass budgets. You only need a majority vote, so Democrats can pass them on their own. But also, too, I think if you look at who's elected now, the open primary system has changed things. There's a, there's a slightly different feel in Sacramento, but the structure of how we spend money is the same, and I think that raises questions. John, I get the fact that there weren't a lot of good options, but yeah. one of the big eye-popping numbers was at 33-plus interest rate. Why was it so high? Who negotiated that, and why couldn't they get a better deal? I think the bottom line, Scott, is that this was very unusual debt. This was deficit debt. This is paying your operating expenses. And I think investors on Wall Street wanted a higher yield, a higher interest rate, and they sure got it. It was lower than it could have been. And I think it's also important to point out that Jerry Brown's push to pay it off earlier saved us some money. But yeah, it still was a lot of money. 
and rolling it off of the books is a big deal. It's almost a billion and a half dollars more every year the state now wow. has to use for other services now that we're not paying the debts of 2004. What are the political implications going forward from all this? Steve Wesley, for example, mm -hmm. we saw him in the ad earlier, told me recently he plans to run for governor in 2018. Could this come back to haunt him? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in a short word, yeah. If you think about the Steve Wesley ran for governor in 2006, both the men in our story, Phil Angelides and Steve Wesley ran. Wesley got reminded through that entire 2006 campaign of his partnership with Schwarzenegger. I think it could easily happen again. Schwarzenegger used to call him my, my buddy, my little buddy. Well, That's they finished not, each other's sentences in yeah, that ad. It's not a great thing for politics when but you're But there were really no profiles in courage at that time, no. were there? I mean, who was standing up saying what we would think of as the right thing to do? Raise taxes, you know, do it in a more measured, balanced way that would be more prudent well, uh, for the taxpayer? I think that both of the men in our story, Steve Wesley, Phil Angelitis, believe they did the right thing. Angelitis thought you should have taxed a little bit more. Again, I think that, that the clock was ticking. People were worried about the state running out of money. And again, voters have had a tendency to, to pass bonds thinking, not really seeing the impact of all the borrowing that that cost. And I don't think that that was emphasized in this campaign. The governor ran around with a great big credit card, you know, a big a photo op, but there wasn't a lot of talk about this as a, you know, 10-year payback plan. So under Jerry Brown, we now have this rainy day fund, uh, and we can't do what we did back then, right, because right. the proposition prevents that. So are we now going to avoid this kind of thing in the future with the rainy day fund, the higher tax rates and everything? I certainly think it helps uh, stave this off. Uh, I mean, you're going to have money that's going to be set aside, but the long-term structure of how we spend money, the tax revenues, the volatility of relying on income taxes, that is still there in California. And uh, we got to hope the economy keeps going well. But this is the end of an ugly chapter, and I think everybody should celebrate that. Well, bottom line, John, real quickly, uh, what is the biggest lesson here for state officials and for taxpayers? Um, be a little <laughs> smarter with your with, with your money, I think. I think the bottom line probably is that uh, you've got to look for long-term fixes. I think you've heard Governor Brown talk about that we've got to fix the long-term structure, but he also hasn't pushed those forward. I think until we change the balance of revenues and spending and how we get it and when we do it, I think we are always susceptible to great big ups and great big downs. All right, John Myers, thank you for that history lesson. A million dollars yeah. a day in interest, astounding. I'm still blown <laughs> away by that number. It's huge. All right, John, thank you. And that will do it for us for tonight. For all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org. I'm Scott Schaefer. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Tweevu. Have a good night.